If you're not familiar with uh, Bessel van der Kolk, he is a, a psychiatrist and uh, uh, has worked for years in the area of trauma. Uh, one of his best known books is The Body Keeps the Score, which I highly recommend. Uh, Seaburn Fisher, uh, <clears throat> I told her she should have written this book a long time ago. Uh, but uh, treating uh, a neurofeedback in the treatment of developmental trauma. Now, she starts off with neurofeedback. This is a great book, even if you never do any form of biofeedback or neurofeedback. If you do, she really kind of walks you through the process uh, that she's learned over decades of working with these children. She's a social work worker. She's been director of agencies in the city of New York, in the state of New York, where that was, uh, uh, was the stop for where these children many times were placed. And uh, this was the end of the road. And so out of her compassion, therapist heart, she began to try to find ways to help these kids. And this is the story. And um, it's a beautifully written book, OK? Uh, I just feel like. Gosh, why did you wait till you're 70 years old to write a book, you know? And uh, what comes through is this therapist's heart. And the way she describes these cases, it's prosaic. And, uh, and, and it, this would give you a great introduction um, to the clinical approach to the realities of this, uh, apart from all the neurofeedback kind of work. So I strongly recommend uh, the book. And... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, for some providential reason, those two got uh, connected and have been collaborating ever since. And uh, this is a picture of the books uh, if you ever uh, want to pick them up. Okay. Brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma. Okay. You have to pay attention to the whole person. <clears throat> in terms of uh, research, I've always... Uh, have people ask me, well, is there any research for neurofeedback? My God, there's a mountain of <laughs> research uh, for neurofeedback, spe specifically for uh, PTSD. Uh, last count, 258 scholarly peer-reviewed uh, studies published on neurofeedback and PTSD, OK? <clears throat> 18 on neurofeedback and reactive attachment disorder. Uh, and that's just in the area of PTSD and uh, RAD. Van der Kolk um, published two articles last year, one early in the year. It was a pilot study, and uh, it was chronic PTSD and using neurofeedback. And uh, basically, he was using one of the basic protocols that Fisher developed, okay? They had pretty good results with that, and then they published a follow-up, okay? Uh, some refinements to the approach, uh, just a more rigorous uh, study, and, um, and we'll, we'll look at that uh, in a moment, but he was, he was uh, able to actually document uh, some efficacy in this. As Shanda mentioned, we have a uh, PTSD track uh, in the counseling department at UTSA where we're doing neurofeedback. We're basically setting up, we've been going at this uh, this whole year, but basically setting up to replicate uh, Van der Kolk's studies. Um, our, our cohorts are in the program for one semester. Okay, so at the beginning of each semester, we do, a, we have a, group of clients, we do assessments, we do, neuro, do neurofeedback, uh, and then we do follow-up assessments. And uh, this would be EEG, symptom assessments, this kind of thing. And then uh, the next semester, we have some that continue, then we have a new uh, group of uh, uh, clients, and we just continue. Well, we're still, we're still working the bugs out because we want this to become uh, statistically robust, and uh, 
but uh, we've had that going on this year. And also, we've had an anxiety study going on since 2014. We published the uh, uh, pilot in uh, 2015. And so we have uh, now seven semesters of data uh, that were when I say we, it usually means me. Uh, I'm crunching the numbers on. But uh, fortunately, as the program's grown, uh, I now have a graduate assistant and a bunch of enthusiastic students that are more than willing to, to help me. And uh, Shanda was my first graduate assistant. Thanks be to God. <laughs> what a gifted woman. <laughs> and uh, uh, so. But you know the program is is really growing, developing. It's quite quite uh, exciting to me and a lot of fun because this is master's and doctoral level. We've got uh, at least two <coughs> dissertations being proposed uh, using neurofeedback and, and this kind of thing. I'm not here to sell neurofeedback, so I'm going to kind of move on. But here's the uh, randomized control study, the follow-up uh, that was done um, by Van der Kolk and his colleagues. Certainly not by him alone. Uh, just a, a, some ideas of the study design, uh, the inventories that were used. Uh, we're actually trying to use those same inventories, and uh, which requires some training. Uh, um, also, uh, replicating the uh, type of training and protocol. Here's what they found. Um, so they had a uh, treatment group and a wait list condition, okay, as their control. And uh, post-treatment, a significantly smaller proportion of the neurofeedback group met criteria for PTSD than the wait list condition, okay? So at the conclusion of the study, there were a significant number of the people who were treated that no longer met the criteria for PTSD. That's basically what that is saying. And uh, they found uh, measures of tension reduction activities, affect dysregulation, and affect instability seemed to uh, be affected the most, uh, most positively. And um, also the effect sizes uh, between these groups could be uh, compared to those reported for the most effective evidence-based treatments for PTSD. Yes, ma'am. I believe there was a one month okay. follow up. And then any after the one month? Not that I've seen, yeah. Not that I've seen. Okay. So uh, this, this was a fairly robust uh, study. And uh, so it looks like we, we've got another tool in the <laughs> toolbox uh, to help. And uh, um, Vander Kolk really endorses yoga, EMDR. And neural feedback, okay, is, uh, those, those have caught his attention as developing therapies, although we don't normally think of yoga as a therapy, right? But uh, send, send your traumatized folks to yoga. <clears throat> we are going to talk about Alex, not his real name. Alex's parents uh, have uh, provided consent uh, for me to use this uh, case in uh, research and to tell the story. Um, when Alex first came to me, he was seven years old. And uh, when, I, when I met him, he was sitting in the uh, waiting room with his adopted parents. And uh, I don't know how else to describe it, but he just had a look like he was uncomfortable, not only in the office, but in his own skin. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. You know, if you've seen it, you know what I mean. He just, he was, he was uh, not settled at all. He, was, he wasn't acting out, but he, he just looked fearful. And, uh, uh, but he was able to you know, say hello when I greeted him. And from the very first meeting, I... I, and this is what I do uh, usually with, with these kids, is I'll introduce myself to them, and I'll call them Mr. or Miss, you know. 
and I, I try to get us on the same level. I want to convey respect. I want them to have, a, have input. I will explain to them what we're going to do and get their opinion on that and try to get some buy-in right in the waiting room, okay? And uh, because that was a big step, uh, him even showing up, and I was grateful that he showed up, and I let him know that, and that we were going to be working together. So he seemed, to, he seemed to kind of buy into that enough to come on into the office. And uh, I, I, uh, as I got to know him from session to session, he was not particularly fidgety, <laughs> but he certainly was that first day. Okay. And uh, the fidgetiness kind of settled down. Um, and I say that because there was some, uh, uh, some clinician uh, provisional diagnoses of ADHD. Okay. <clears throat> I'm talking about countertransference here, which I think is normal for therapists in this population. And if you don't have countertransference working with these kids, you're either kidding yourself or lying to us or you have no empathic capacity, <laughs> okay? I don't know how else to say it. Uh, it will touch your heart, right? And uh, actually, that can be part of the therapeutic process. You have to buy in, right? You have to buy in. Okay, I'm willing to do this because you're going to hear some God-awful things, right? Um, so my respect was conveyed continuously. We had a therapist-client relationship. I would call master-disciple, and I'm not going to say I was always the master and he was the disciple. That went back and forth, okay? Uh, because what I've learned is I'm just overwhelmed at the resilience that some of these children convey. It's like I can't imagine I just can't imagine. So it's like as one soul to another, I'm kind of in awe. And, uh, it, you know, that creates a humility on my part. So uh, I'm wanting to know some things from him just at a human level. And the therapy is not about taking care of me, but it just touches me in that way. And I think that gets conveyed. Okay. <clears throat> um, Therapists are at risk of vicarious traumatization. I, one way to say it is your mirror neurons get a good workout. What we discovered about the brain is this mirror neuron system that uh, when you are having an experience with another person uh, and they are expressing emotions that our brains light up in similar ways that their brains are lighting up. That's why it's called a mirror neuron, okay? Sometimes the same signature can be seen in both brains. And uh, uh, so that's the mirror neuron. And you're going to have mirror neuron systems just firing away, okay? Uh, they get a good workout because you will, you will have those, some of those sensations. And, um, but one thing I learned years ago as a hospital chaplain uh, is um, the importance of empathic distance, Okay. And I learned this working in the ER and around trauma centers, uh, children, adults, whatever. Uh, I'm going to be present to this person, this family, this patient, uh, and this is the worst day of their life. But this is not the worst day of my life, okay? This is not my father who's just died, right? Uh, it's their father, I'll grieve my father, <laughs> when that day comes, and it came. Um, but uh, that kind, it's, it's, I hesitate to use the word distance, but it's like at some point separating yourself but maintaining that empathic connection. It's, uh, it's maybe a balancing act, but it's some way where you can go home at the end of the day and at some level leave it at the office, okay? Uh, I still have this hand ri washing ritual at the end of the day. Uh, uh, you know, uh, go to the sink, lather up my hands. I am washing away the emotional germs of the day. And that's the end of, you know, some, it's a ritual. It helps me do that. 
you know. So I'm not thinking about it so much on the way home or feeling the need to talk about it and that kind of thing. Uh, and learning to take care of yourself. Um, now, as this touches into my own history, I would not say my history is tantamount in any fashion uh, to uh, this kind of trauma, but like many of you here, I had uh, some pretty rough treatment uh, as a child. And uh, so how does this touch into that for you, okay? And uh, I've noticed that it will, one tendency is, well, heck, I went through, I didn't go through anything compared to this. Why, why do I have problems? Okay, so I'll minimize it. Well, that's not healthy, right? Okay, it was, it was a pretty crappy stuff, right? And let's just don't write it off. It, wasn't, it, it was in a whole different category, okay? <laughs> Um, but, uh, and, and also uh, avoiding overreacting with the client, okay? So I think keeping that kind of awareness is helpful. What are you doing? Okay. All right, so um, I learned about Alex and his history from his adoptive parents report, thankfully, this was a wonderful couple. They adopted Alex and his younger sister. He was four years younger. And um, they were really into it, okay? Uh, and they educated themselves about dissociation, okay, and grounding techniques, and, uh, and uh, were making good use of various therapies. I learned about Alex from a, a comprehensive psychological evaluation that had been done. I uh, learned about Alex from case uh, worker notes from CPS, gained a whole new uh, appreciation uh, for what CPS case workers do and, and uh, sometimes was absolutely amazed at some of the information they were able to come up with. Uh, and also from the client's remarks during sessions, I didn't, I, I never asked, and I would never ask a client like this to go back and recount, okay? And uh, so those discussions were had with parents, you know, without him in the room, uh, where we would really, you know, have some heart-to-heart -heart discussions about what, what this young man actually went through. Uh, but there would be times when he would just kind of blurt out something, you know, as we were working. <clears throat> uh, what I learned about his biological parents was that his mother had been diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, bipolar disorder, and major depressive disorder. <laughs> she was addicted to heroin and pain medications. Uh, she used alcohol, heroin, cocaine, nicotine, and possibly other drugs while she was present why was she pregnant with Alex, okay? And so he obviously had some of the effects of that prenatal uh, environment. His father had a pretty hefty criminal history involving theft, assault on family members, uh, criminal trespass and assault, okay? So th there you have that little constellation. Uh, there were no record of drug effects at his birth. For some reason, the medical records were not available. Uh, in fact, there was very little record or accounting of his first year of life, except that his biological mother was homeless during that time, and she worked as a prostitute, and she took Alex along with her. So she is taking along uh, a child less than 12 months old, okay? And uh, the environment uh, there, which involved drugs and whatnot, uh, was part of his growing up environment. 